Good evening. I'm Diane Lynch, and I am the Dean of the Park School of Communications. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural public event of the Park Center for Independent Media. Tonight's presentation is the culminating event of a two-day symposium that brought together about 25 of the most active, high-profile, and successful independent journalists in the country. It's a highly eclectic group. It was so fun to listen to them talk. Reflective of the state of independent journalists in a digital age. Many are progressive media activists who have collectively produced an extraordinary body of critically important work in print, in documentary film and television, and in radio, and who brought decades of experience and the wisdom it generates to these conversations. Others among them are newer to independent media, and they have engaged with it not necessarily or completely out of political passion, but because new digital technologies have made independence a viable and exciting alternative to more traditional career paths within media corporations and newsrooms. Like all independent journalists, like all good journalists, the participants in our symposium share a passion for journalism and the truth, a dedication to serving the needs and interests of their audiences, and a determination to figure out new business models and new revenue streams that will make it possible for them to continue to do the work that sustains them and our democracy. We established the Park Center for Inde Independent Media to help them do exactly that. In an era in which we are all producers and consumers of mediated messages, in a moment in our history in which we have a pressing need for the free and unfettered exchange of news and information, it is the mission and the commitment of the Park Center for Independent Media to serve as the source of new collaborations, new ideas, new solutions, and new conversations about how independent media can play a key role in meeting, in meeting the information needs of communities in our democracy. I want to take a minute to thank Adelaide Gomer, Park Gomer, and the Park Foundation, whose commitment to the ideals and the values of a free press and a democracy both, both inspires and sustains us, and who have made not only this symposium and this, uh, this uh, event tonight, but this initiative possible. I don't know where she's sitting, but please join me in applause. is to 
stick it to the establishment, whether it's the media establishment or the uh, political economic establishment. You do that by accurately covering important stories that mainstream media, traditional media, old media are ignoring. You do it by getting off the beaten path and giving voice to the voiceless and the disadvantaged and the marginalized. You do it as Amy Goodman of Democracy Now! says, by going to where, by going to where the silence is and saying something. You do it as Dean Lynch has been a proponent for years by using the new technologies to build interactive communities where there was silence and disconnection. The Park Center for Independent Media is encouraging students to consider career paths in this exciting sector of independent new media, entrepreneurial media, maverick media, community media. We're bringing interns each summer to some of the most exciting, growing independent media institutions. And every year we're going to be giving away an award named after the legendary maverick journalist I.F. Isidore Stone. It's called the Izzy Award. <laughs> Izzy Award will be for the best achievement in independent media each year. Now there was no internet when <laughs> Izzy Stone was at his heyday decades ago. But thanks to new technologies that have brought down the cost of media production and the internet, which has totally transformed media distribution, there's a slightly more level playing field as new media and startups are trying to compete with outlets uh, that are owned by multinational media conglomerates. Our speaker tonight has been a pioneer in leveling that playing field a little bit more. He actually knows a little bit about sticking it to the man. You can ask the former U.S. Attorney General about that. Our speaker was the proverbial lone blogger working at night in his pajamas about eight years ago, and he has built a credible, accurate, journalistic institution on the web that uh, is, has a new, has a growing staff, a lot of young people on the staff, a lot of former interns on the staff, and a very, very active readership. Those are the people formerly known as the audience. Our speaker won this year's Polk Award in legal reporting. He has a PhD in American history from Brown University. He's the publisher of Talking Points Panel, TPM Cafe, TPM Election Central, TPMUpbreaker.com, TPMTV.com. Now what they're saying to yourself, hey, this guy's building a media conglomerate of his own. I don't know about you, but I like it when my media institutions are headed by people who are actual journalists, as opposed to the people that are taking over, have been taking over the mainstream media in recent years as real estate moguls, plastics executives, private equity firms. I present to you blogger, journalist, entrepreneur, Josh Marshall.
takes me out of sort of what i think about on a regular basis because my whole all of my energies are taken up with doing reporting and running the business that TPM has become. And that, you know, when you're working sort of in the trenches like that, sort of the media big thing questions can be in some ways, I wouldn't say that they're a distraction, but it's a very different set of questions to be thinking about. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the company that I run, in addition to all those different sites that Jeff just read off, we have, we're headquartered in New York City, lower Manhattan. We have 10 employees. We have, on any given month, we have between one and two million readers. There's all this basic outline of who we are and what we do. And we are basically a combination of opinion journalism and traditional shoe leather reporting, both on politics, on campaign reporting, and investigative journalism. That's the, it was one of the first reporting sites that we rolled out, tpmmontrego.com, which is basically a site about, it's investigative journalism, but it's with a heavy focus on public corruption, breaches of the public trust, and so forth. And then, when we talk about entrepreneurship, you know, investigative journalism is not usually a profit center for most journalistic organizations, but we tried to make it such. So what I want to talk about this evening is first about TPM, Talking Points Memo, how it came into being, and particularly how it's grown since we've never had, we've never had investors in the traditional sense. And when I started it, I was, you know, barely feeding myself, so I didn't have any money to invest in it. And how we, how it has grown has really been a combination of finding, it's a for-profit, we're not a, we're not a non-profit organization. And it's really been a matter of finding new ways, you know, kind of new revenue streams that we can support a growing staff and support always five or six reporters. And also critical help from the community of readers who sustain the site. So the site, the site started in November 2000, actually during the Florida recount. And that wasn't just fortuitous, that was why, why it started. At the time, I was the Washington editor of a magazine called The American Prospect, which at the time was a, at the time was a bi-weekly, it's kind of gone all back and forth, I think it was a bi-weekly then, it's back to a monthly now. Started it during the, the recount, and I think three or four months later, I quit the job at the Prospect, not to, not to do TPM, but to be a freelance journalist. At the time, this was, again, this was late 2000, kind of just before, maybe not before the, the tech bubble broke, but before the implications of the, of the tech bubble breaking for freelance journalists was completely clear. So when I, when I left the Prospect, I thought I was going to keep, you know, making a decent living freelancing as I, as I, as I had when I was at the Prospect. And that quickly became not the case. And I spent a couple years basically just, just getting by, and, and, and TPM, something I did on the side. It was really nothing that I ever thought would make me an income, or be a business, or be anything besides a sort of side project I did to my freelance journalism. And in some ways, I mean, when I, when, at the time, how I justified it to myself was seeing it like as a lost leader, basically. This was a way to kind of attract attention to my writing, to editors who see it, and then they would, you know, give me, give me assignments and allow me to pay my rent and, and to eat. So when, when I get asked about it, when I get asked about TPM today a lot, and when I say that, you know, that the site made, had no revenue or made no money for the first three or so years that it was in existence, people will say, well, that, that was, you know, that, I guess that was your startup phase, you know, before you, before you, you know, kind of the, the revenue started coming in. It was never like that. It was never something that, I think I had, you know, fantasies that, that at one point someone would, would, would come to me and want to advertise on my site, but that was never the, that was never the idea. It was, as I said, it was a sideline to my freelance reporting career. And in, in the symposium today, an anecdote that I, that I, I discussed and what I was going to talk about in, tonight was in 
2003 and early 2004, a couple of things happened that really, not planned, kind of fortuitous, happened that started the site kind of on the path to, to where it is today. Now, one of those things was a guy named Henry Copeland uh, was trying to get in touch with me because he had a company called Blog Ads. And he had this idea that uh, you know, there was a market for advertising with blogs. And since, since these were mainly one-person operations, that he could be like the, uh, you know, the ad sales force for the blogosphere. And as I, norm as I often do, I sort of either didn't answer, kind of brushed him off for, for a few months and, and didn't, um, didn't sit down with him. But finally I did, and he kind of uh, sketched out what it is he was uh, proposing. And so I figured, you know, that well, can't, can't hurt. And in pretty short order, that ended up bringing in, you know, a substantial amount of money soon enough that I could, um, by 2004, it was, you know, that was basically already my income. The blog was supporting me through, through, these, through these ads. Um, the other thing that happened was, again, as, as I mentioned, um, I had been at this magazine, The American Prospect, for, uh, I guess, three years. And that had been uh, most of my experiences as a, as, a, as a working journalist. And after I left The Prospect, I would, as most freelancers do, you try to get it, if you, know, if you want to go to, um, want to go to New Hampshire uh, to cover the New Hampshire primary, you get some assignment and I'll pay your way out there if you want to go to political conventions and so forth. So um, in late 2003, um, I think I had said, this just occurred to me a few days ago, I think, I think the way I got the idea is that, some of you may be familiar, there's a, a blogger named Duncan, um, Duncan Black, who's got a, a, a site pseudonym online is uh, Atrios, and I think, I think what had happened is he had, um, his computer had broken. So he asked his readers to send him in money so he could buy a new laptop computer. <laughs> and I noticed that, um, I can't remember exactly, but like, he came up with a new computer really quick, you know? <laughs> and um, and I, 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 you know, I may be, it may be fuzzy in my, in, my, in my head, but basically like, he got like the $2,000 or so you need for a laptop. Really quickly, so it's, you know, kind of got me, got me thinking. You know, I, got, I have to, I have to work this into my model too. Um, so I put up, a, you know, in November or something like that of 2003, put up a thing saying, I want to go. You know, I want to cover the New Hampshire primary for the blog. I don't have to do it on the side for the blog because I'm working on a piece for the Atlantic or, or, or the New Republic or something. I want to do it pure blogging, and um, so I put that up. And I think after 24 hours, um, six or seven thousand dollars had come in. Um, now, in the, in the scale of the organization that I'm running now, that's you know that's not that big a thing. But at the scale my finances were at the time, that was a very very big deal. Um, and obviously, and I shut it off because I couldn't really think of what I would do with more than six or seven thousand dollars. Exactly. You know, you know, buy a new car to drive up there or something like that. But I wanted to, I wanted to keep it, um, keep it within reason. So th those two things combined, that it, it advertising started to allow me to make a living running the blog, which obviously had all sorts of personal implications for me, but was also a big deal um, for the site, just the amount of time that that I could uh, that I could dedicate to it. So. Fast forward through 2003 and, and, and uh, into 2004, obviously what for me was a fairly uh, disappointing uh, 2004 uh, election. After the, after the 2004 election, I started, you know, for the, for, at that point I had done the, done the blog for going for four years. Um, I guess actually a, a, a little more than four years. And it had become sort of second nature to me, even without kind of thinking about it, as um, you know, giving a lot of conscious thought, the way that I made use of the readership as a source of information for me. That it was from readers that I got tips, that I got, you know, tips in the traditional journalistic sense, got tipped off to, you know, when new stories had come out, that a lot of what what I what I did on the side is sort of a hybrid of traditional journalism and what we would now call collaborative journalism. You know, working with working with readers. Um, I did a lot of writing on in the beginning of 2005 on the on President Bush's effort to privatize Social Security, and in that there was a lot. I, I used a lot of you know working with readers to 
proved to be a series of corruption scandals, in this case, Duke Cunningham. And again, I was really aggressive in reporting on this story and used some of that collaborative journalism that I mentioned with Social Security in that case. Now, the site's audience was growing. And so I was getting more and more, especially as I did more of this kind of interactive reporting with readers, more and more tips, more and more information coming in from the readership. And at the same time, I had been, at that point, I had been writing the blog more than full time, you know, like 24-7 for four years. And, you know, I wanted, I didn't want to just keep doing it the way that I was doing it then for the next 10 or 20 years or something like that. So I had the idea that if I could get, hire a couple of reporters, reporter bloggers to do something like I was doing, you know, we could make even more use of all this information that was coming in. So I basically married that together with that, you know, that $6,000 or $7,000 epiphany from the New Hampshire Foundation and went to readers and basically said, there were two, I did two fundraisers from readers in 2005 to start two different sites. One was PPM Cafe, which is our community discussion site. And then later that year, I did a fundraiser for TPM Muckraker, which was to basically, you know, take the model that I had been pursuing with that kind of collaborative, you know, interactive reporting with readers and, you know, have more, have more meetings there to make more use of all that information they were bringing in. So I went to readers and it was successful sort of, you know, beyond my expectations, I think, for the, for the Muckraker fundraiser, I think we raised a little more than $100,000. And basically what that allowed me to do, and again, this was, I didn't have, there weren't investors behind the company. I didn't have savings to do this with. So it was basically going to the readers and saying, you know, I think I can do this. I don't have the funds, but if you think you'll enjoy it, you know, this isn't contributions of $5,000. This is people sending in $10, $25, maybe $50, you know, the occasional $100, $250. But certainly 95, 98%, you know, $50 and under. So, you know, you get, you get 2,500 readers to send in that kind of money. You can get enough money to really put together a project like that. So that's what I did. And that allowed, that basically gave me the money to go out and hire two reporters for a year. And my expectation was that that proved to be true, that after a year it would grow enough that we could sustain it, sustain it through advertising. So that, that brought us up through 2005 and 2006. We did another fundraiser at the beginning of 2007 because we wanted to expand our, expand our, our Washington reporting. The, and since, basically since the, since 2007, what we have been trying to do is go from being, first we were a blog. Second, we were a blog that had, you know, sort of more of our own reporting muscle, a series of, a series of reporters working from, working from one office and so forth. But what I, what I thought, and again, this is really coming off of the 2006 election, that there was no way to, to effectively, to support the original reporting that we wanted to do without going beyond just being a blog and doing original reporting to be a full service news site for what I would call serious national news and political news. And what I mean by that, and that's when we went, we, we 
you're interested in, again, serious national news and political news, you can either find it all at TPM or you can find a portal to it through, through TPM. And the reason that um, I made that decision was because you need to have the kind of, again, this is a for-profit company, um, so, and, and basically 100% of the revenues come from advertising. And to have the kind of advertising revenues you need to have uh, you know, six full-time reporters, you can't just um, have you know, two or three stories that you're following and have the sites updated a few times a day. Because that's never, that's never going to make you a destination site for news. What, what we have tried to do, and again, this is um, both, both uh, editorial goals to this, but also um, business goals, how, how is this thing in business, that uh, being a news junkie myself, you know, when I come back to my desk at our office, you know, I'll go and I'll click on CNN. Because I just want to see, or, you know, New York Times or whatever, I'll even go to Drudge because, you know, <laughs> not to be struck down by God or anything. Um, these are places I want to know if there's something new in the news world that I exist in. That isn't just my obsession, but it's also my profession. Um, I want to know if something's happened, you know, since I've been away at lunch that I need to know about. So, and um, even before I did this kind of stuff, you know, so I'll be clicking on those sites kind of constantly through the day. And I think this is a, this is this is a pretty um, this is. You know, this is a common thing for people who are, are sort of news junkies or politics junkies. So you need that you need to compete. We decided that we needed to compete with basically with the CNN home website and the New York Times website and, and the Washington Post website. Now, obviously, there's a lot that that they do um, that we can't hope to do with the staff of ten people, but we can through again through our own reporting through very rapid updating of breaking news, whether it's linked out to, to other websites, whether it's to the AP reporting that exists um, you know, in a, on our own site, um, and so forth. That, and that, that is the way that we, would, um, that we would have the amount of traffic and therefore the amount of revenues to support the original reporting that was really key to what we wanted to do. Um, and we've been fairly successful at that. Um, the growth of audience and in, in, in growth of, of, of revenues uh, over the last two years. And it's, you know, the, the, final, uh, the, you know, the final aim is, again, the kind of original reporting that we're able to do, particularly original reporting in areas, to go back to uh, what Jeff was saying, stories that are not, either not getting attention or are not getting the kind of sustained attention that uh, we think that they that they should be, um, and it's you know sort of born fruit and things like the U.S. Attorney story that we did a lot of reporting on in 2007, a series of, of stories over the last couple of years that we've um, really, you know really been out in front of, of a lot of the mainstream media, even on stories that the conventional media, by their own actions, eventually decided were you know. Or, or big stories. One sort of side note on that: that's not just a um, that's not just an ethical journalism imperative because of our site. You know, we have just for sort of as a, as an example uh, to, to use the U.S. Attorney story that we worked on a lot in, in 2007 as as, as an example. Um, before that became a big story, we had it all to ourselves. So we, we had every break there was. At the point at which it became, it really broke into a major scandal and a major news story, at that point, the Times and the Post will each throw half a dozen reporters at it that have um, years of experience and more resources, um, probably um, better sources in a lot of ways. So we constantly face this, um, this I'm not sure ironic is the right word, but usually, when, we're, when we've been ahead on a story, the point at which we succeed, we also lose the story. And we, we can no longer really um, do much of anything. Because at the point at which, again, at, at the point at which uh, half a dozen major news organizations throw all their resources at a story, it's very hard for my 
to investigative reporters to make, you know, to make much headway, especially when, um, when we're as aggressive and, and, and uh, not nice as we, as, as we often are. So that is, that, that has brought us to the, to the, to the current, um, uh, the current form of the organization and its size and the different things that, that we try to report on. Another thing that we have, in the last year and a half, we've uh, invested a great deal in video, um, partly because we think that is the direction that you know, web technology is going, and there's more and more, uh, more and more hunger for, for, uh, for web video, but also because um, you know, the blog format is a, it's an acquired taste, and it's not for everybody.
of journalism. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, what I'd like to focus on is how that model of journalism is rooted in the economic changes of, of business and journalism over the last half century. And um, one of the key ways is if you think about, you know, earlier in the century, if you had a even a medium-sized city like Pittsburgh or Louisville or Phoenix, you know, most cities would have several newspapers. Um, the model of those newspapers was not that they would serve an entire community. It just wasn't the concept. They weren't, um, you know, you want to sell as much as you can, but that wasn't that wasn't the concept. In a similar way, um, if you think of, you know, CNN and uh, Fox and MSNBC, and to a, to a lesser degree, the broadcast networks, the concept there is CNN's model is everybody should be watching CNN. Everybody. That's that's the model, and it, it used to be the case before before Fox and MSNBC came along. Basically, if that is your model, if you are the single newspaper in San Francisco or Kansas City or St. Louis, you are just highly constrained about how rigorous you can be in the accuracy of your reporting, because the whole model is you are appealing to everybody. Um, so I think, you know, in a lot of ways, that the kind of conglomerization of media, not just major corporations nationally, but even at the more, at the, at the regional and city level, that you have kind of single news organizations that have something close to a monopoly, at least over a certain kind of media, the way I just, I just said with, uh, with newspapers, it creates a heavy, creates a great deal of pressure to embrace that kind of, what, what I would consider that flawed model of journalism. So one of the, one of the things that is most important, critical about independent media is that you have a, you have news organizations for, for which it is not part of the model that they ideally want to be everybody's dominant news source. Because if that's not the case, you don't have that need to satisfy everybody. And that need, that underlying need to prioritize balance um, uh, over, over accuracy. So that is really, to me, when I think about what's, what's most wrong um, with news coverage today, that's really the most important thing. And I think that's why the existence of an independent media sphere, for lack of a better word, is so is so important. You know, it's a secondary matter. The more the more voices that you have, the more takes on the news, you, you you're just going to have a more vibrant and, and diverse sort of news ecosystem that I like you know that I like to think of it as, as opposed to you know having you know two or three gatekeepers that really control uh, all of the news. Um, so so again, many reasons why. is 
are we just in a period of tumult that will settle down and we'll have the same, you know, same kind of dominant enemies. Um, you know, maybe it'll be TPM. Okay. Um, you know, that, that sort of dominate parts of the media space, or, or is there something about the technology that has created just a permanent and greater ease of entry into into the space? Um, I think the latter is the case. There is just, as, as, as Jeff was saying, it's simply undeniable that, I mean, the way that TPM came into existence without any concept that it would be a company with, with multiple employees and no money behind it simply would have been possible in any, in any technological universe before the one that existed in the last 10 years. You needed that ability to start from the ground up and, 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 and build uh, incrementally. So I think there are, are reasons why the, the kind of dominance that existed um, earlier in the century with newspapers um, that still exists, although to a, to a weakening degree with the, the cable networks and, and, and the other major national uh, news organizations, that that kind of dominance I don't think will be possible in the foreseeable future as long as the internet itself, the structure of the internet, um, uh, remains the same. And that's why issues like uh, net neutrality are so important, that you, that you have the internet structured in a way that um, new players have, have that kind of ease of entry. The, the one final point I'd, I'd, I'd like to make, and this is this, in, in, the, in the discussion we were having today, you know, a lot of people think of independent media um, as being synonymous with nonprofit media, either intentionally nonprofit or, or accidentally, or you know, <laughs> accidentally nonprofit media. Um, and you know, the the, the I, I spent most of my my twenties in graduate school, but the the, the uh, media job that I had uh, before I started TPM was at a magazine that was that was a nonprofit. So um, I'm you know familiar with that. World, and I think that there's there's no doubt, especially when um, the models of journalism under are under such strain as they are today, that that the nonprofit sector is a critical part of the existence and the vitality of, of independent media. But I also think that it's critical for to have independent media be vital and independent. I mean, nonprofits get their money from some, they get their money from foundations. Now those foundations tend to have a much more benign set of asks of the organizations they support than, you know, advertisers do, but it still, um, it, it, it still limits um, independence in, in a lot of ways. And I think that for, for to really to have a, a kind of independent media sector that we want, and again, one that's vital, one that's independent, one that is critically in touch with readership. That again, in my, in my experience, and, and I get criticized for saying this sometimes, um, the, the magazine that I work for before I started TPM, I think the fact that our continued existence was not based on the size or interest level of our readership allowed us to be cut off and, and not particularly uh, in touch with what our readership would find interesting. I think that was um, not just bad in business terms, but much more importantly, uh, bad uh, was bad in, in, in journalistic terms. So to make that possible, what, what is, is really critical is to come up with a series of business models, you know, not just to be able to have um, someone start a blog and maybe develop an audience just on their own, which is critical, but also to have the, the business models and the kind of ancillary um, entities, advertising collectives, stuff like that, um, that make that possible. Because again, I think it's somewhat in contrast to um, a lot of people's 
views on this. I actually think that for, again, as I said, that for the independent media sector to be, um, to be independent and vital in a, in a, in a deep way that it, that it needs to be, it also it needs not only to be rooted in the nonprofit sector, but again, in the in, in for in the for profit journal. So that's um, that's well, I, I, won't, I won't get into a larger discussion of capitalism and so forth, but <laughs> that's what I think. Um, in any case, um, when I'm at these talks, I always find the question and answer uh, portion of the talks much more interesting than the speech. And I know. Who 